was laying in my bed back in my parents' house in Kennesaw, Georgia, when just before I closed my eyes, I looked up. What did I see? Stars. About a hundred glow-in-the-dark plastic stars. <laughs> Why do we do this as kids? Is it because it's cool? Well, yeah, of course it's cool. But it's something else. Is it because it's comforting? Is it because we were born looking at space with a sense of hope, not fear? Something that silently beckons us to seek the unknown and tells us there's always light when it's dark, all we have to do is look up. After a few minutes of reminiscing, I realized I had placed those stars above my ceiling, or on my ceiling, a few weeks after my father and I experienced our first meteor shower. We were camped out at Kennesaw Mountain National Park, illegally, of course. <laughs> and together, we watched about 200 beams of light shoot across the night sky. Incredible. But aside from this celestial fireworks show, there remained one often forgotten rock set in the cosmic stage above my eyes. The moon. Often people forget that we've put a man on that rock before. Multiple times, actually. But what happened? Why did we stop going? When did we stop looking up? The greatest human achievement of recent history happened 45 years ago. In July of 1969, man embarked on the most epic journey to the unknown since the birth of the human race. The Apollo 11 mission to the moon was an embodiment of decades of science fiction morphed into reality. In fact, it happened so quickly that the public projected missions to Mars and neighboring planets by the mid-1980s. Let's look where we are now. The year is 2015. Where are these manned moon missions? Where are these manned Mars missions? See, people failed to realize the true reason why we went to space. We were in the heart of a Cold War with Russia, where the idea of high ground became critical between the world's two superpowers. Once Russia proved it could not land a man on the moon, we stopped going to the moon. We did not leave Earth because of some cosmic manifest destiny, but purely a geopolitical driving force. We left for the wrong reason, fear. But the saddest part of this whole tragedy are the forgotten and tangible effects that NASA had on the economy, culture, and innovation of the early 1970s. But that's okay, I'll remind you. NASA made that which was impossible possible during a time of global disorder. It was a time that favored the future and imagination blossomed. Society welcomed ambitious innovations just, excuse me, just as it did with the space program. During the Apollo 8 mission, which is the first time we left Earth and circled the moon, we took this, Earthrise. The mission's purpose was to discover the moon when in reality, we rediscovered Earth. See, Earth was no, map, no longer mapped out with countries or borders like we see in our classrooms. There were no longer racial or religious warring states. It was one team, one perspective, and one home. From this, we saw the formation of Earth Day, the Clean Air Act, the Environmental Protection Agency, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, industrial giants like Pittsburgh began massive-scaled city cleanups, all in 1970. Through 1974, we saw the formation of Greenpeace, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the U.S. Wind Energy Program. Now, I'll stop there, but there are many more. NASA proved to be an organization like none other on this planet. It was a crucible for the dreams and dreamers of our future. The Apollo 11 mission in particular birthed an entire generation of scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians. See, my father was born in 1956. So around the time of the Apollo 11 mission, he was about 13 years old. And wow, did he love space. NASA had captured the heart and mind of a young boy seeking acceptance for a future in math and science. Many years later, he graduated with a degree in aerospace engineering and is currently working with Lockheed Martin. I can assure you that others in these fields, like my father, would attribute the Apollo missions as just one reason why they decided to pursue a STEM field. Like my father, 
I too marveled at the night sky. I grew personally jealous of those who had traveled the cosmos before me. However, as I got older, I was introduced to this new perspective that robots were humanity's new explorers. They were our modern astronauts. Let me ask you something. When you look back at the newspapers of 1969, whom do you see on the front page? Who do you see in the buses and the limos at the ticker tape parades? Who are the heroes? Is it the device that took a picture of Neil Armstrong as he made his first steps on the lunar surface? No, it's the astronaut. We are inspired not by the instruments of an orchestra, but by the beauty of sound from the musicians who play them. Our astronauts are a more powerful impetus for inspiration than any unmanned mission could ever be. Yes, manned spaceflight is very expensive, but the costs are greatly outweighed by the benefits of dreams. But this brings me back to my original question. Why did we stop going? I'd like to show you where our nation's greatest agency is currently heading. So in 1966, NASA's budget represented about 4.4% of a tax dollar, which by the way, is more than plenty. Do you want to know what NASA's budget is now? Four-tenths of a penny on a tax dollar. I'll say that again. 0.4% of a penny on a tax dollar. Now, I'd like to put this in perspective for you in a truly incredible way. If we look at the entire 56-year running budget of NASA, whole thing, it's still billions of dollars less than the TARP bank bailout during the 2008 housing crisis. Wow. Our civilization's greatest medium for birthing the thinkers and innovators of future generations is currently underfunded. I worry that as NASA's potential falls out of tune, future generations become increasingly deaf to the sole instrument that composes the notes of wonder, inspiration, and unity. But still, you may ask, why should I care now? I'd like to answer that question by showing you the two most resonant effects of NASA and why this agency still matters. First and foremost, we are writing the equation to destroy our only planet. As we deplete it of its finite natural resources, flood our coastal cities and teeter on paths of apocalyptic asteroids, we must ask ourselves, how much can our home take? Carl Sagan so poetically once said, since in the long run, every planetary society will be endangered by impacts from outer space, every surviving civilization is obliged to become spacefaring. Not because of exploratory or romantic zeal, but for the most practical reason imaginable, staying alive, end quote. See, by becoming a multi-planetary species, we secure our very own insurance policy. Just as you insure your home, automobile, or health, we must do the same with our planet. Lastly, it is conservatively estimated that there are this many stars in the known universe. That's one with 29 zeros. Again, a conservative estimate. Now for me, it is naive to think we are alone in these zeros. One of the greatest things about space is we really don't know what's out there. Multicellular organisms, probably. Intelligent life, maybe. But it is now that we must quench that ever-expanding thirst to prove we are not alone. All great achievements in human history were a leap into the unknown. Those that failed to do so were left behind. Let us seek this unknown. Let us dive into the fabric and handwriting of reality. Challenge our smartest minds to goals of moons, planets, and even star systems much further than our own. Science fiction, you say? Well, with great comfort, I can say, that's, that's been, been said, said before. before. Thank, Thank you. you.